Hello, and welcome to another painting tutorial. Today I want to do this lovely sunset scene in pinks and some dark greens in the foreground. So we're going to have to work a lot on color matching and getting some good sense of uh, space in our landscapes. So let me go ahead and show you how I would go about painting this scene. I'm starting on a watercolor block. If you don't have a watercolor block, which is a pre-stretched watercolor paper that is attached to a block of stiff cardboard by this black gumming around the side. So as you finish a piece, you can cut it off. If you don't have a block, however, you can stretch watercolor paper on a piece of wood and staple it down or tape it down. Or you can um, use paper that's less quality and doesn't need to be stretched at all. If you're using a rag paper, however, make sure that the first thing you do is stretch that paper and get it ready to go. Then I'm going to prepare my margins, just using some masking tape. I've already marked off some margins, but I like to have really nice clear white ones preserved. And if I tape them off before I start painting, that means that when the painting is finished, I can peel those and have a good sense of how the painting would look matted. And it also helps you to see any flaws. They just pop out at you when everything is taped. Looks like I'm even going to have a challenge with this aspect of it today, so let's hope this doesn't mean the painting's going to be as tough. <laughs> Okay, when that is done, I'm going to use a, a regular old HB pencil, school pencil, and I'm going to sketch just the really basics of the scene. This way I won't get lost when I start painting and forget where the sky is supposed to end and this water is supposed to be and things like that. So I'm going to just look and see where the endpoints of the major landscape structures um, cut into the margins. So here, at this point, at this point, and this point, those would help me to place these. And notice how this isn't quite in the middle, this is closer to the middle. Then over here, I have this point, and this point, and this point. I'll do the same thing, and then also look for the center points. Just because they don't cut the margins doesn't mean you don't need to find more things going on. And usually I would say horizon, but in this case the horizon line is not clear, nor is it really straight. We have kind of a jagged mountain thing going on here. So instead of doing the horizon lines, I'm going to look for these points of bisection. And I'm just kind of getting a feeling for the composition in this stage. So this one is about in the middle, and then this one is slightly above. So I've got this landform here, and this landform here. This one. Boom, boom. And 
this interesting thing going on here. Fairly straight. And that might be as much as I need to do. Now I'm going to take some time to examine the picture itself. The sky is a really light pink and it has this cut through of a yellow. And then I have this white of the water that matches the highlights of the pink here. So I could actually start with this pale pink color and just cover my paper all the way down to the tree line. So I'm gonna do that first. I want everything to look as smooth and realistic as possible. In a landscape scene, you don't have um, clear lines of where one thing ends and another begins a lot of times, especially when your mountain forms and things are pretty far away. So I'm going to start with a nice unifying pink color. And it's going to be very light. So right now I'm just painting some clean water over most of the canvas or watercolor paper. Not all the way down to the bottom, but I'm getting most of it done. Then I'm going to get my palette mixed up here with some a bit of alizarin crimson and some cadmium red. But the key is to keep it really, really light. The cad is a little bit more orangey. So if this is the tone that I have, but I keep it nice and wet, that'll be about right. So I'm going to paint down, first of all, this light pale pink. And this is going to be my highlight color later on. So even my brightest whites in this painting aren't white because the sunset color is unifying everything in the atmosphere. It's this really pale pink. So my first step here is to paint everything that pale pink. And then I'm gonna let that dry and we can push forward. All right, very easy. First step done, let it dry. All right, that first pass is nice and dry. So what I wanna do here before I do any more painting is to get my masking fluid and I'm just going to preserve my whites in this river. Because if they get too dark, it's not gonna look like water anymore at all. That's the only thing I'm going to, ooh, well, uh, there's a couple of lights down here. If I want them, I'm gonna save those too. But I think I do want them. So, go into your drawing, your painting rather, and just protect those small patches of lights in the water. My needle tool is clogged up here, so I'm doing what I can to unclog that. don't have all day so I'm going to just put a little bit of the masking fluid on a piece of scratch paper. Whoop, that's plenty. And then I'll just dip into it like I'm using a quill pen. And that works fine too. Especially because I only have a little bit to do here. Be really careful though when you put down masking fluid because everywhere that you protect is going to have a very clear clean edge 
So you don't want to protect things that you don't want to be really light, bright colored. So I'm going to go ahead and put this down, let it dry, and then I'll come back and show you how to continue the painting. Okay, now the masking fluid is dry, the sky is dry, and it's time to move forward. So we're going to start, remember the color we have put down is this really light color. So everything pretty much needs to go darker and that includes our sky. So I'm going to match up this color first of all. Get my water, get my nice two inch flat, and then I'm going to use some alizarin crimson, some Windsor red, and some cat orange until I have this really nice raspberry color. Okay, I have my color. I've matched it up. So now I'm going to just work with a nice wet wash top to bottom and put down some nice cloud shapes like this use some loose strokes and whoop. yikes what a nightmare here we go just wipe that off easy fix and what you want to have happen is that you're having the colors mix on the page. And I want some different tones in there too. That makes a nice interesting sky. So up here at the top, I'm going to kick up the contrast and I'm going to add some nice reds. And then in the middle, there's a vivid yellow patch. So I'm going to mix up a yellow, kind of a pink yellow, and slide that in here. So that's nice. Keep my brush nice and clean. Get some more yellows. And I need to work while it's wet, but not too wet. <laughs> dry, but not too dry. So it's kind of tricky. The trickiest part of watercolor, in my opinion, is learning what colors will stay and how much mixing will go on at different levels of moisture on the page. So that can be very, very tough. And then underneath here, I'm just going to keep it really light because I want to keep some of these interesting shapes. I want everything to get washed out. And I also want there to be a definite change from dark at the top to light at the bottom. So that's what gives you a sense of space. That's what's going to help you to have the painting push back. I really like the way these are uh, kind of puffing out. It's a nice watercolor technique. It just happens naturally. That's the watercolor mixing on the page and that's what happens with the paint itself as it dries. So it lends itself really well to skies and clouds and foggy atmospheric effects like this. You just have to learn not to be too heavy handed and let the watercolor do its thing. Just kind of let the watercolor paint itself. It's not like any other medium that way. Your oils, your acrylics, your opaque mediums, you have a lot more control. And 
and they're also a lot less difficult to manage because of that. With watercolors, you need to really learn how to let go and let a lot of this amazing stuff just happen. Just trust that it's going to happen. Learn the basics of what brings about different techniques and different effects, and then just go for it. So I'm going to bring my sky down just a little bit lower. That way I don't have any awkward stops between the mountains and the sky, like the sky is painted around the mountains. I don't want it to look like that. So I'll bring this down lower. Don't forget though, you really want to keep it light down here so it'll look like it's pushing back. And it's tempting to do more and more and more, but I know that I'm going to have the best watercolor possible when I trust what's going on on the page and let it do its thing. So I'm going to stop. It's going to add a few little clouds here though before it goes completely dry. These are with a darker raspberry color so it'll look like shadows and they'll stand out a little bit more. But since the paper is still so wet those are going to do a lot of mixing and a lot of fading. It's going to disperse that color and then it's going to look really natural like a real cloud in the sky. Okay. Yeah. And remember especially with watercolors, you're not going to get exactly what it looks like on the photograph. You just can't, especially when it needs to be loose like this, when you need a sky. And so you don't even shoot for that. You're not shooting for a photorealistic copy of this sky. You want a sky that looks vaguely like it and that captures the same things that you like about this sky and try to get those captured in your painting. Okay, so this is where I'm going to leave my sky. I'll come back and we'll push down a little farther. Alright, the sky is dry, so now we're going to go with this light purple color. And it also goes from dark at the top to lighter as it pulls down. So we're going to do the same thing. So mix up your color carefully. If you still have some yellow on your palette, just make sure that the yellow and the purple don't touch because that will make an ugly mud. And if you need to redraw that top line, do so. But since the sky is so light, it would it's going to be hard not to see your pencil line after you're done painting. So you just have to make the choice whether or not it's important to you not to see that pencil line. Then in this case, I'm going to work dry on dry or wet on dry. So my brush is wet, but the paper is dry. And that way I can get these really distinct little treetops. See how I just use the very corner of my large brush? And then on the back of your brush, you might see that it has this flat blade. You can use that to come up and make some really nice little treetop looking shapes. Just drag them right through that wet paint. And that technique works quite well for things like this. But then before it has a chance to dry, keep on going and then you need to... This is difficult because you have to go fast and slow. You have to slow down where you want to do those um, little blade moves. Obviously you can't do that super fast or it will start to stop looking like trees then you really need to keep going, otherwise it's going to dry and those colors won't blend. And as you come over to this way, the color changes slightly and gets a bit more orange. More treetops. More treetops. Okay. 
Don't make them too regular. They're not matches in a box, they're trees. Good. And I'm just gonna brush down over the top. Maybe touch into the top here with a few more darks because that way the color will bleed out and it will give it a more interesting variation from hard edge to soft edge. See, this is already forming this really nice hard edge. So you want to have some hard edges and some lost soft edges in your paintings. I'm gonna go down here with just quite a bit more orangey red. looking really nice. And all of this area in here sort of blends together. Get some nice pinks and purples and oranges. So I'm going to drop in some pinks down here by the river. And some places I want to leave it and other places I want to um, go in again with some more details and some more darks. But I just, there, just softly brush in over the top with some unifying color. Getting everything to the same wetness again and that will help to keep down the drying in layers. I don't want it to dry in layers will look streaky and the streaks will detract from what it's supposed to be conveying. And I want to get some of this foggy feeling down here so I'm going to just blot, kill some of the color, focusing on the bottom. That'll work. And then we're going to let that dry before we move on to anything else. But there's one thing right here. I know that this edge is supposed to be more cloudy, so I'm going to pull it out right now. And that will make that edge bleed right here. So to cut down on some of the bleeding, I'm going to blot again. Okay, so that's what we're going to do and let that dry and then we'll push forward again. Okay, this pass is dry, so we're going to put in this mountain right here. Same exact way. You mix up your color really carefully. Use that flat on the edge. And here the lines are a little bit more distinct. I'm going to go all the way up to that, um, all the way up to the masking fluid, and then just brush it down. And again, it's a little bit foggy, so I'm going to blot the bottom. So I didn't dilute with water. I like to blot to make things look a little bit more foggy. And if you want to, you can do the same thing and bring some of those little tree shapes out on the very edge of the mountain. And that can look really fantastic. Then. I'll do some work on this side with the purple. So I have to mix up my color again. Sorry about that, I forgot my mic. So in case it was hard to hear, I just added this, mixing up that color beforehand and matching it against the reference material and then just washing it down and blotting it. Whoops. Was unusual. <laughs> uh, but it's fine. Everything is pretty much everything is fixable in watercolor. I like that about it. You do just have to get in the um, 
habit of putting things down once, but all right, let's do this purple mountain. Purple mountain, it's a little bit darker than what is happening behind it. So I'm just gonna use that flat on the side, but I need a little bit more paint to keep it darker. And I'm just always using the same technique, flat on the side, and then swoosh, down we go. And here I want there to be a, light, a nice combination of some different colors going on. So I'm getting some alizarin crimson to make that more pink. And then I just add it right to the edge here. And we're gonna go all the way down to about here. Wash over right about there. Okay. So let those colors all mix together and I'm gonna add just a little bit of this additional pink to the water in here. So it's the top of the river. Just to sort of separate this from what's going on um, with that lighter color. It will help make the contrast darker when we take the masking fluid off and it will make those brights pop out. And that will help it to look more like water. So I'm going to wash over all of that. So we're getting a nice gradient layering effect here, which is very good. And I might want to blot a little bit of this. Give it a try and see how that looks. Okay, so we'll let this dry and we'll come back and we'll do more of the middle ground stuff. There is one thing too, since I see some interesting textures going on in here and over here, I think I'm gonna do a little spritz of water like this. And we'll just see what becomes of it. Sometimes that can make a really interesting modeled texture that we can work with and start to sort of suggest some more tree textures going on down there. So let's put it away, let it dry, come back to it. Okay, we're gonna move on down to this stand of trees. And so this is almost our last level. We're going to do this, let it dry, and then we're going to work on this foreground element, which is kind of fussy, so it's going to take a while. But let's do this first. It starts out darker at the top, and then it gets really light and pink here at the bottom. So we're going to paint it the same way. And it's purple going towards a little bit more um, dark, like greenish at the top there. So I'm going to mix that color up. a lot more detail seen in this level 
than in the other levels. So do take your time and you might need, I might need to go into a different brush. Let's see, that's not quite the right color either. That's too purpley. That's a little too greeny. I want it to be that sort of brown in between because it can't look too green, not with the sunset going on there. Let's add some, oh, that's good in there. That's better. Okay, then I'm going to scrape up and form some of these small, delicate looking tree forms. this way doing that same sort of work so I'm going to keep a few highlights too. see how I brushed over the top here and kept some white gaps there are some white gaps in the painting and in the reference material it helps it to look more like a stand of separate trees Whoop. That's fine. A lot of that went over the masking fluid. That was my water bottle falling. I'll need it, but I can't take the time to bend down for it right now because this is important to finish all in one pass. I can't stop and uh, come back to it because even right here, it just starts to dry you get a line and then it's not going to look like a nice even pass anymore. So especially when things are in the distance, they tend to look very silhouetted. You can only see the very jagged sharp outlines and a few little details. To make it look realistic, those small details have to grow out of the mass of color and not be separated. So you can't do them at the end, you have to do everything all together. And then it's going to go way more orange down here at the bottom of this pass. It's a pretty significant color change. But I want it to look like this is all the same flowing part of the mountain all coming together with these different colors. So that also requires that you work it up while it's all wet. So while, I'm, while I've got some of this lighter color, I'm also going to drop in some more of the darker color again here and there, see how it's mixing. That's good. Covering up any edges that might have gotten a little too dry. Rinse my brush out, get that lighter color back on it, and go over the top with the lighter color too. So I'm making it mix on the page. I'm forcing these two opposite colors to get along. Make something interesting happen there, you colors. And then over here, I'm going to get a sponge. This is a um, natural looking sponge. So not your kitchen sponge, but it's not a too flat one either. I'm going to get some of this darker purple color. And I'm just gonna sponge a little bit of texture on like this. And 
and this sponge allows it to go down quickly and also retain a lot of those lighter colors in between. Then I'm going to get a little spritz, so now I'm going to go down and get that water bottle. Let's focus in here so you can see the change I get when I just spritz it a bit. I'll spritz over here too and get some more of that mottled texture. And then that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to let it dry, come back to it, and we'll start doing some stuff in the foreground. All right, this is dry, so let's move forward. Pushing forward in the picture plane, this is what comes next. It's still in the background, we've got quite a bit of pinks and purples in there, but it's going more towards the green. So, I'm going to match that color. It's very similar to that dusty purple color that we put down before. I'm just using one of these test strips Got it. So then we're going to go start in the background here with this interesting tree shape. You're going to save time if you have enough paint on your brush to begin with. I can also even try putting that in with my sponge to get more of a broken up texture. So let me see how that looks. Yeah, I kind of like that. I try sponging in some of these frawny looking trees too. So you're just using a bit of the edge of that sponge, I can get some of that broken line. So using different tools other than brushes can be really great in painting because it um, necessarily is not going to look quite so painted, so intentional. And a lot of the strength of watercolor painting actually comes from having things that just happen, sort of this free-flowing not overly controlled, not overly painted feel to watercolor that you can't get with any other medium because other mediums are opaque and you can't layer them and they don't change their um, consistency so much. Watercolor changes a lot based on how much water versus how much paint and then whether or not the surface is wet or not. But um, other styles, other paints don't really have as much alteration like that. So, you know, when you find something that you like with your watercolor paintings, you can really just go with it and try a lot of different things on. So here I'm sponging with an actual sponge, but you can also do all kinds of things. Um, and remember, to get a really good variation between controlled areas and free-flowing watercolor -y free areas, make sure that you protect the essentials before you start doing anything like this. So I have my highlights that I wanted to save. I've got those preserved with masking fluid and that's one of the things that really allows me to go a little bit more free and experimental in this phase. but I'm still using the same ideas of breaking up the monotony by using a lot of different colors on the sponge. 
I'm getting this base tone down, getting the areas wet, but then I might accent with my brush. So here I can go in now. Now that I've got the foreground, the background of the foreground, as it were, kind of basically put in, I can go back and punch up some of those colors. and accent with some darks using the brush. And see, I'm not brushing, brushing like stroke, stroke, stroke. I am putting down little blobs of color, knowing that they're going to spread out. And then I can also do some of that same back end of the brush, both for consistency, so that it's still reading as the same kind of texture. This is foliage, and I've put it in back here with some back end texturing, so I'm going to do the same thing in the foreground. And that will help to let the eye see what's going on here is the same thing that's going on back here. So it unifies the painting just as much as using color patterns. And you don't want one target area where this is the first time that I have a big yellow target for instance, or a, a bright red blob, and I don't have red anywhere else in the painting, that's going to create a problem. It's going to be disharmonious in the painting. And the same thing can go for the texturing and the styles. So if you want this sort of tree that's all throughout the painting to look consistent, put it down in the same style. Whether or not you use a looser approach or a tighter approach, depending on being in the foreground or background, that's not as important as you using the same sort of oh texturing effect or brush stroke or whatever it is. See that that'll help tie those trees together. And again, it's super important to keep some of those lights popping through. So don't cover everything. But here I have an interesting tree pattern going on. Back here, gets a little bit different. And then I'm going to start to indicate some branch shapes just by tapping with the flat side, the blade side of my flat brush here. Got a little bit too thick. So let me blot that out. I'll let that dry and then I can go back into it Then in the background here, I have some more deliberate tree shapes. I'll just form individually like this with my brush, not with the sponge. And then after that dries, I can start to sort of indicate those red roofs.
Okay. So let's let this dry and then we can come back into it and start adding some final details, some little leaves. We'll take off the masking fluid and we'll finish it up from there. Okay, we're ready to move along here. The first thing I'm going to do is take off the masking fluid. You can see that because of those strong contrasts around it, this is looking like a very white river, even though we painted it that pale pink first. I'm also going to take off this masking fluid, and now we're going to work on the details of the painting. So, I'm going to go to my round. I'm going to get a couple of rounds out here. I've got a uh, uh, number four, and then a smaller one. This is a zero. So that's a four, that's a zero. And with the smaller rounds, I'm going to do my detail work in the foreground. So I'm going to work on the trees, keeping the reference material really close. I need to go a lot darker though. We'll just put in this interesting shaped tree that's here. Just bouncing the brush back and forth will make a cool contrast. I mean, we'll make a really interesting texture. And just try to make your shapes as large as possible. So don't make a lot of disconnected small fiddly shapes. It's a lot stronger to try to connect those shapes. Even if they're small and intricate, try to join them. Like here, see I'm going to make this intricate shape with all these little fronds. I'm going to connect them and I'm going to draw the stems down while that paint is still wet. And that is going to help to strengthen this shape going to be more interesting and it's going to stand out stronger. So even though there's some delicate detail shapes in here, it's still pleasing because it is standing together as one shape. And that goes for everything that you paint and draw. Don't separate your shapes, try to connect them as much as possible. Bum, bum, bum. I need to do some more of that type work up here. Like a few little stemmy areas. Just like so. And in the background. Come over here and I'll add some more those little intricate tree shapes with a nice dark color so that they'll stand out. So you're just kind of making it more interesting by adding these little these little details. Here we've got these really cool fronds the pine branches or whatever kind of tree this is, you can see a lot of these little leaves and branches standing off and that is a eye pleasing shape so I want to keep that. You're just going to have to take your time and put that in carefully. So the rest of the painting goes quickly and then when you get to the foreground you necessarily need to slow down a lot and add these small details. It's just a lot of patience. But this is the process. So that's the process. I'm going to finish. So that is the process.
Okay, then I'm also going to add, well, let's see. I'm gonna soften this river up a bit. So I'm gonna use my angled shader. Here we go. This is this little craft brush. I've been using it for years. I just like to get it damp, clean water, and then I soften out the edges. And it works especially where, well for small areas when I've used masking fluid. And I've never applied masking fluid where I don't need to do this to at least some extent. So it's not an indication of making a mistake, but when you are done with the masking fluid and you've peeled it up, those edges are gonna be really, really sharp and they're probably not gonna blend into the painting as well as you need them to. So then this is what you need to do. Well, it usually actually works to your benefit too because it is too light colored also. So softening the edges also means that I get a little bit of this exterior paint mixing in with my water and it looks just perfect. soften up this line as well. And just Soften and blend any areas that are sticking out or look a little bit awkward. Or where you made little mistakes and you need to clean up lines and small areas of paint. This is the method to use. But now let's go back down into our foreground. We've got all these interesting red buildings. They have bright red roofs and it kind of gives it a little bit of a point of interest down here. So I'm going to keep it. I'm going to start by just painting some of these orangey red roofs. I'm going to not necessarily even see them as roofs at this point, just shapes. There's one down here. There's one over here. This one's pretty light, so I'm gonna blot my color. And we've got here and here. bit of indication of some things going on in there. Then there is another building that stands up in this area. And you know, it doesn't really matter if this matches exactly what's on the reference material. It really doesn't. You just want to have the indication of these buildings. So you can choose how much you want there to be. I 
and then after they dry we're going to go back over the top with some more of those little branches. Over here I'm going to add some more of these skinny little lines that can be trunks and branches of the trees in here. And these details, it's hard to even notice the difference right away. But all together, they're what makes the painting look really professional and interesting. So do take your time putting these in. But this is the system that you're going to use. And notice how the details are the last thing that you're going to put in. I know that that makes good sense but you'd be surprised how often you're tempted to start overworking one area before the large shapes are in place. So don't be working down here until everything in the background is good. Once this is dry, I like to test with my the back of my knuckle so it's not quite dry yet, but this light area is. So once that's dry enough, I can go in with my dark and I can add these little bitty windows to my buildings. And these small details are what will make it look then like a fully formed building. Even though there's not much detail going on, you just need enough. Just enough so that the eye will see what you're doing. So let me work in this way for a little bit off camera. It's going to just take this fiddly little little brush and the little details but now you've seen the way that you do it just kind of take your time really closely examine the reference material put them in little bit by little bit um, and then I will come back to you in a few minutes after I've done some work like this and I'll show you what we do to finish it up Alright, so I've added some final details in the foreground, so those really come out and help add different levels. <clears throat> so there's more detail here where we'd be expected to see it, and then you get less detail, and then it's very sweeping and gradual in the background there. Um, so this is the original, and there are a few things that you can also add. If you want to bring out some of these white highlights, let me show you an easy and quick way to do that. You can use white paint over the top, or you can use something called Pro White, which is really good. It works well with watercolors, and it's not exactly paint, but it does the same function. So just get a little bit of Pro White or Aqua Cover, same principle, and it mixes well with the paint. Pro White actually I like a little bit better. It doesn't get so chalky as Aqua Cover. But then I can just go in and I can add these little whites that kind of stand out and make things pop a little bit more. So I just see a few details here and there. I can get them back. If you need to clean up the river, you can use the Pro White or the Aqua Cover the same way. And you can mix it with different colors and get some uh, tints. So if you need some bright yellows back. It doesn't work though as well as you might think. So the best situation, or the best way to go about your painting is still going to be to avoid your whites or your light colors, to protect them or to work around them, and then um, put them in last because you, you really can't get the good over painting in watercolor. It's not an opaque medium and so it just it never looks quite as good. It's never going to look very fresh. It's always going to look overworked. So don't think that you can just go back. If I've made a mistake I can just go back and paint it over with white or with light yellow mixed with white. Like No, it's not going to look as good. So do take your time. Do do careful planning. And then when you've pushed it up as far as you want to, you can just take that masking tape off on those white borders 
really pop out they help you to see any other mistakes and they make the highlights pop forward of course it also helps to make it a lot more finished looking so there is our finished painting of course if I needed to I could go back into it and add some more final details whatever but this is the process and now you're at a state where you can certainly do this painting at home so it's a lot of fun and it's good to get some practice matching colors and getting atmospheric effects with the fog using the blotting technique and of course layering by painting back to front so this is certainly one that I recommend you download and try on your own at home paint it multiple times if you want to you're gonna learn something every time so I hope that you've learned some things you can take with you into your own studio and as usual thank you so much for watching